And in the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales, we begin this narrative frame where we're introduced to all these characters who are going to eventually tell their own tales. And the first person we meet is the one noble, and that is the knight. And the knight, we get a, a pretty typical character. This is the way knights are described in a lot of uh, stories about knights. Of course, we have a lot of stories about knights. We have King Arthur's knights, Charlemagne's knights, uh, you know, more recent knights uh, in, in England going to the Crusades and this sort of thing. And it seems that this character of the knight is pretty much that sort of chivalric, you know, noble. Uh, he's described as being valorous and prudent, and yet he was as meek as a maiden in his bearing. In other words, he's so strong he could, you know, push people around and be a bully, but he's not. He's showing this reservation, and that is what chivalry was, or how it was defined. Uh, having the power to, to fight, but having the maturity and respect and, and modesty not to. But then we don't have his appearance. Uh, we have a few clues that he's not exactly the same as the, the cliche stereotypical knight. And that comes when we have his garments described. Uh, to tell you of his equipment, his horses were good, but he was not gaily clad. Uh, he's not dressed in a lot of uh, expensive clothes or armor. He wore a jerkin of coarse cloak, all stained with rust by his coat of mail, for he had just returned from his travels and went to do his pilgrimage. Uh, some scholars, one scholar in particular, has suggested that this indicates that this knight was of the noble class, but he was, like a lot of nobles during this time period, had lost a lot of his money, either through going on crusade or uh, through some other circumstance that we're not told of. He's part of the nobility, but he doesn't have the wealth that the nobles typically had, and uh, the fact that he's gone to the certain particular battles that, that are mentioned later, uh, that are described, these are all battles in which the English employed mercenaries. Uh, so they weren't just nobles that were going there on their own dime. They were people that were there, that were there because they needed to be paid. And there's an implication, it's not stated outright. Uh, Chaucer doesn't come out and, and accuse him of being a mercenary. In fact, he's described as the perfect noble, quote unquote, uh, uh, knight. But there is at least a hint that he may have sort of fallen on hard times and be uh, a mercenary who's actually going to Canterbury uh, to, uh, on this pilgrimage in order to seek forgiveness for things that he's done in battle at these uh, uh, particular battles that are, that are listed. The scholar who uh, makes that argument first uh, is named Terry Jones. And I only mention him because uh, he's more famous if you've ever seen any of the Monty Python uh, movies or TV shows. He's a member of the Monty Python troupe. You know, he was a, a medievalist, a uh, medieval scholar before he was a, a, an actor. Uh, he's one of the ones that's, uh, thanks to him, movies like Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail actually do make fun of things that uh, historians recognize as, as accurate. Uh, it's actually one of the better, more historically intelligent uh, uh, King Arthur movies. In fact, I'd, I'd go out on a limb and say Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail is the most uh, intelligent and historically based of all the King Arthur movies, uh, if, if that tells you anything. But the fact that we have this ambiguity in this character is uh, something that we wanna pay attention to because this description gives us some of the things we expect from the stereotype, but then it gives us a few hints that maybe the stereotype doesn't fit. Maybe we need to pay closer attention to some of the details about this character. And once we're sort of aware of that, maybe pay attention to some of the details of some of these other characters. But this is a, a character exposition. Uh, this is the first time we see a character uh, that we're going to learn more about later on. Uh, these character expositions in uh, the hands of a good author are never gonna be totally random. Uh, the author is gonna give us specific details that we're going to apply later in, in our understanding of a character. But that's essentially what the general prologue is. It's a series of character expositions. All of these uh, characters are gonna eventually tell their own story, but before that happens, we need to know something about them. Uh, something about their outward appearance, about the sort of, uh, the jobs they do and the things that we might expect to, to learn about this character type, but also a little bit about their inner life, or at least hints of who they are beyond these, these surfaces. And, and that's something that's very important, and Chaucer wouldn't be including this in the character exposition if it wasn't really important. There are a few other subtleties in a lot of these characters. Uh, uh, another example is the, the prioress. The prioress, this is someone who is in charge of a, a priory, uh, someone who comes from a noble family but uh, dedicates her life to the church. And the prioress, we might expect a, a typical sort of very saintly, very sort of 
a non-worldly uh, lady, but actually this prioress, there are a few clues that she's still more of the, the lady, the, the, the nobility, uh, a, a member of the, the upper aristocracy, as much or more than she is fitting the type of a, of a uh, woman of the church. In particular, the way she's described, the way that Chaucer as a narrator describes her matches a description in another work that was a little bit older and a little bit more famous uh, than, than Chaucer's, uh, at, at Chaucer's time. Uh, and that is The Romance of the Rose. Uh, the Romance of the Rose was uh, just a few generations uh, older than Chaucer. It was written in French originally, but Chaucer actually translated this, and it's a really large work, he translated it into English. He was very much aware of it, and it was, you know, in Chaucer's time already very, very famous. But in that work, there is a woman uh, who's just described as an old woman because the, the Romance of the Rose is full of stereotypes. Every, uh, every character is an allegorical character. They stand in for a character type. And this one old woman uh, says that she remembers how to seduce men, how to uh, get what she wanted from being a proper lady, but a, uh, the, the proper lady being someone who's defined as being good at following social rules, but also getting other people's attention. And she said, you know, to be one of these ladies, to get what you want by getting men's attention, uh, this, this kind of woman, she must be very careful not to dip her fingers in the sauce up to the knuckles when she's eating, nor to smear her lips with soup or garlic or fat meat, uh, nor to take too many pieces too large or a piece and you know, put them into her mouth. In other words, she needs to eat very delicately, not just sort of you know stuff her face, things that your parents probably told you to do when you were growing up, just as part of, uh, sort of how to eat civilly in, in public. But this is the Middle Ages, so uh, this, this is a sign of, of nobility, a sign of class, uh, but also a way to sort of maintain people's attraction, men's attraction especially, without sort of giving in too much to your, uh, to your hunger or uh, to habits that might not suit in polite company. She must hold the morsel with the tips of her fingers and dip it into the sauce, whether it be thick, thin, or clear, and then convey the mouthful with care so that no drop of soup or sauce or pepper falls onto her chest. When drinking, she should exercise such care that not a drop is spilled upon her, for anyone who saw that drop happen might think her very rude and coarse. And she must, sure never, she must be sure never to touch her goblet where there is anything in her mouth. Uh, let her wipe her mouth so clean that uh, no grease is allowed to remain upon it, at least not upon her upper lip, for when the grease is left on the upper lip, globules appear in the wine, which is neither pretty nor nice. Uh, this might not seem very relevant. Why am I picking this random passage? Because it's almost a line for line, or it's almost translated line for line in the description of the prioress. Now again, this a prioress is not someone who's trying to get attention from other people. She's not someone who's trying to appear ladylike. Uh, you know, we might think this isn't necessarily ladylike, it's just civil. But that specific advice, translated line by line into English, is Chaucer's way of letting us know that this prioress has more in common with this woman from The Romance of the Rose who is very concerned with what other people think, with uh, blending in with the aristocracy, with getting attention from men uh, and maintaining their attraction and, and definitely not losing it while uh, she's eating by appearing uh, crude or coarse. And so when Chaucer says she had been well taught in the art of eating and let no mor morsel fall from her lips and wet but her fingertips in the sauce, she knew how to lift and how to hold a bit so that not a drop fell upon her breast. Her pleasure was uh, all in courtesy. She wiped her upper lips so well that not a spot of grease was to be seen in her cup after she drank. And very dainty she was in reaching for her food. And surely was she was of so fine behavior, pleasant, uh, amiable, and bearing. She took pains to imitate uh, court manners, uh, to be stately in her demeanor, and to be held worthy of reverence. She's very much following the advice of this woman who's sort of giving advice to young ladies who are, who are out to win a husband, let's say. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that she's not a very good uh, woman of faith or something like that? Well, no, but uh, just like with the knight's uh, sort of dirty clothes, or rust-stained clothes, it's just a little hint that there's more going on with this character than the stereotype would typically uh, uh, indicate. Uh, so this may be a bit of digression, but remember the, the digressions in Beowulf, they usually had a purpose. Uh, and like a lot of the digressions in Beowulf, they were allusions to stories people were expected to know. 
And a lot of the allusions in Beowulf seem like things that the audience is supposed to know, but we don't know because we don't have the, the stories they refer to. Uh, fortunately, we do have the Romance of the Rose, and we get some of these allusions. Now, there may be a lot more allusions that we don't even notice in Chaucer. Uh, he may be referring to texts that we don't have anymore, we don't know, but this one we can get. And it's clear that Chaucer expected his audience to make this connection. Uh, then we have a character of a monk, and of course, uh, a good monk is supposed to spend his time in the monastery. He's supposed to spend his time uh, uh, reading the Bible, reading the works of the church fathers, uh, praying, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, that's not this monk. This monk is very different. Uh, this monk, we're told, uh, was very fine and, and handsome. He was a great writer about the countryside and a lover of hunting. Okay, well, if he's uh, riding around the countryside, that's not staying in the cloister now, is it? Uh, monks are supposed to eat very modestly, just like they're supposed to dress very modestly. and eating venison is not modest, that is, that's the good stuff. You know, you're not supposed to uh, demand this, you know, uh, the, the finer things in life when you're a monk. You're supposed to renounce the finer things in life. He had many fine horses in his stable, and when he rode, men could hear his bridle jingle and whistling wind as clear as a loud chapel bell or the Lord was prior. But Chaucer tells us that because the rule of St. Morris and, uh, or of St. Benedict, uh, so the Benedictine monks, where that was a particular uh, order of, of, of monk, uh, and Saint Benedict creates these rules for monks that tells them not to do this sort of thing, not to pursue the signs of wealth and not to be self-indulgent the way this monk seems to be. But because the rule of Saint Morris or Saint Benedict was old and something austere, this same monk let such old things pass and followed the ways of, newer, of the newer world. He gave not a plucked hen for the text that hunters are not holy that a careless monk, that is to say, one out of his cloister, is like a fish out of water. For that text he would not give a herring. And I said his opinion was right. Why should he study and lose his wits, ever poring over a book in the cloister, or toil with his hands and the labor as St. Augustine beds? Uh, how shall the world be served? Let St. Augustine have his work to himself, therefore he rode hard, followed the greyhounds, his hunting dogs, uh, as swift as birds on the wing, so this monk is being described as not following the rules of monasticism, the rules that define what a monk is. So he's, you know, he's got this job, but he doesn't follow the, the basic uh, expectations of that job. And Chaucer's not criticizing that, or at least it doesn't sound like he's criticizing it. He says, I said his opinion was right. So does that mean that Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, the author, approves of this monk who doesn't follow the rules of uh, monasticism? Maybe, but maybe not. Keep in mind, Chaucer himself has written him, himself in as a character in the, the Canterbury Tales. In the general prologue, he's talking in the first person. He says, I went to the Tabard Inn. I became one of their company going to, to Canterbury. And it's that voice that Chaucer uses uh, as a narrator that that is the, the voice, that this character of Geoffrey Chaucer is saying, he gave not a pluck ten for that a text that says hunters are not holy, and I said his opinion is right. So is this I, is this Chaucer, the historical person, uh, saying that this is the way monks ought to act, or this is fine, or is he sort of creating a, a self-parody? Is he creating this, this character? When we read a text like this, we always wanna separate the narrator from the author, even when the author does as Chaucer does and says I, and speaks in the first person. Uh, this is, you know, we allow him to have, to create himself as a character within the text and not necessarily hold the historical author to that same uh, character. And Chaucer, the author, seems to give us a lot of uh, indication that this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, just like he doesn't come out and tell us that the knight may have been a mercenary or that the prioress was a little too concerned with uh, aristocratic niceties uh, and you know herself and, and the monk was a little too concerned with uh, self-indulgence. Uh, also, he's creating himself as a character but giving us a few details that lead us to wonder, is this actually, are we supposed to take this at face value or are we supposed to be a little skeptical of this? Are we supposed to look deeper? Uh, is Chaucer the narrator really the same person as Chaucer the author? And for us, we wanna be very clear in our distinction. Uh, Chaucer the author had a motivation, whatever it was, for creating Chaucer the character uh, in the way that he did. So we're gonna keep those separate and we discuss it in this class. Uh, so Chaucer the character exist within a narrative frame. Uh, he's uh, within a narrative, and of course, this narrative frames other narratives. Uh, he can be self-critical, he can sort of maybe give himself as a caricature, uh, 
But because he's within this narrative frame, we're gonna be suspicious of his voice. We're gonna treat him just like a character rather than treating him like the author, as the one who sort of necessarily knows uh, everything and whose explanations are necessarily the ones we wanna listen to. Uh, so a narrative frame, and we've talked about this before, a narrative frame is a, uh, the narrativization. This is when you take all these different events, all these different people that may have existed in history or, or not, but they could have been stories that were passed down in oral tradition, but you select which ones to focus on. You select where to start, uh, which event is gonna be the first event, uh, which one are you gonna tell first, uh, which one are you gonna tell last? What's, what are the beginning and ending gonna be? And then which events are you gonna put in the middle and how are you gonna explain them? How are you gonna say, you know, did this thing cause this other event or did one thing just happen after the other without a cause? Uh, I might say that a character did this thing but when it comes to deciding why he or she did it, I have to sort of add a little bit. This is all narrativization. Now, if the events within that narrative are themselves other narratives, like a character within the story tells his or her own story, uh, then this is uh, a framed narrative. Uh, so we have a narrative frame, and then within that frame narrative we have lots of uh, other little narratives, uh, as we do in the, the Canterbury Tales. But this technique of using this frame calls attention to the way that narrators shape the stories according to their own limited perspectives and agendas. So the people telling the story within the story don't know everything. And when narratives are embedded within other narratives, each narrator creates his or her own frame. They, the, the character now is, is telling a story the way he or she uh, thinks they ought to be told. And sometimes characters are gonna dispute how to tell that story. That's why we need to keep the, the narratives within that frame distinct and be aware of the difference between those or what actually happens in the larger narrative. So the reader has to recognize how each narrator's individual point of view structures his or her narrative frame. Now we've done this before. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, we recognized in Tablet 11 when Atrahas, or when Utnapishtim starts to tell the story of the flood, we have read this before, line by line, when we read Atrahasis. It's not the narrator of the Epic of Gilgamesh telling the story of the flood, it's Utnapishtim saying, back when I was younger, there was a flood, Ea or Inki uh, uh, told me to build a boat. Uh, so the Epic of Gilgamesh is the framing narrative uh, the story of Atrahasis or Utnapishtim in Tablet 11 is the narrative that is framed within that larger narrative. Uh, similarly with the Odyssey and with the Aeneid, uh, both Odysseus and Aeneas tell their own stories of their adventures. Uh, when we hear the story of Polyphemus the Cyclops in the Odyssey, it's not Homer or the narrator of the Odyssey telling us that this happened, it is Odysseus telling that story to the Phaeacians. When we hear about the a Trojan horse in the Aeneid, uh, but especially when we hear the description of Helen of Troy, uh, that's not coming from Virgil, that's coming from Aeneas when he's telling the story. It's, uh, she, Helen is described from the perspective of a Trojan who sees her as the reason for the destruction of Troy. Does that mean that Virgil thought of her that way? Well, we don't know. It's not Virgil uh, immediately telling the story, it's Virgil telling the story of Aeneas telling the story of Helen of Troy. Chaucer does this kind of thing, but like Boccaccio, he has a lot of characters telling uh, their own narratives within this narrative frame. And he introduces something that we haven't seen before in the Iliad or the Odyssey or the Aeneid. Uh, he introduces an unreliable narrator, a narrator who, who, of whom we are suspicious, a narrator who fails in some way to tell the story accurately or objectively. Uh, so we don't have to take this narration's word for it. It seems clear that Chaucer, the author, is being critical of the monk uh, in a way that Chaucer, the narrator, is clearly not. Uh, so that's why we need to distinguish Chaucer, the author, from Chaucer, the narrator. Chaucer, the narrator, seems to approve of the monk not acting like a monk. But Chaucer, the author, by calling attention to that, seems to be holding it up for skepticism, although he doesn't himself uh, give a, an explicit criticism of that. But that makes our job as readers a little bit more difficult. We have to, in order to understand what's happening, we're reading about the monk and we're making up our own minds about the monk, but at the same time, we wanna compare that, like our own impression of the monk, with uh, the narrator's impression of the monk. And I see, okay, Chaucer the narrator is describing the monk this way, but here's what I know about the monk. I can sort of cross out lines uh, in my head, sort of mentally as I, as I read, and see when he says things like, and I said his opinion was right, I can sort of say, well, I might not agree with that opinion. I can create, I can, using theory of mind, I can create a, a, uh, an impression of the monk. I can create, create my own uh, 
judgment about the monk that is separate from what the narrator tells me he thinks about the monk. But I can still compare that to the way the narrator uh, does it. So I have to do both. There are a lot of uh, literary critics, especially in the early 20th century, that said uh, it's wrong to read a character and make up your own mind about that character as if that character was a real person. Uh, instead, what you're supposed to do is always remember that this character was created by an author. Well, you, want, you should, but uh, think about this as listening to gossip, uh, a term that I'll get into uh, that it actually comes from this time period and meant something different. But when you hear gossip, when you hear one of your friends saying, uh, talking about another person, uh, you might just take at face value whatever your friend tells you and just assume, okay, well, I'm gonna believe everything he says about this other person. But usually you're gonna be, take that with a grain of salt. Okay, well, I understand why he would say that about him, but I don't know that I think that about him. Uh, it's the same thing we're reading this unreliable narrator. We, we get his position, but then we also compare that. We keep both versions, our own version and the, the narrator's version in mind at the same time. Now, like the monk, uh, there, is, uh, there are several other uh, clerical figures, uh, people who work for the church. And these seem to be some uh, more obvious than others, uh, subjects of ridicule by Chaucer the author, and maybe or maybe not Chaucer the narrator. Uh, and the friar is one of these because he's a person, th this type of uh, official is someone who's coming under a lot of scrutiny at this time. Remember that the great schism has happened and that has sort of forced people to recognize that uh, the church is not infallible. If there's two popes and they disagree with each other, this is a new problem. So people start to look at the different institutions of the church and the, the people who work in those institutions a little bit more skeptically now. And friars are people that uh, travel from place to place. They can absolve you of sins just like your local priest or parson can. But sometimes they're gonna you know, ask for a donation. And the more of a donation you get, uh, uh, the, the more easily uh, this friar is gonna uh, pardon your sins, gonna you know, give you a, uh, a absolution for your sins. And of course, if you invite him over to dinner, he's gonna be even more friendly. And you start to wonder, is there a connection between the amount of my resources I give to this person and my, the, the status of my soul? Uh, well, there shouldn't be, especially you know, if the things I'm giving up are just going to serve one person. Uh, but that is the, the thing we're sort of confronted with, with Hubert, the friar. And Chaucer, the narrator, says that, you know, he calls him a begging friar, which is, you know, the friars are supposed to not demand money, they're supposed to beg for it, and if people don't give them something, they accept that and, and be a good representative of the church anyway. We're told that he knew all the town taverns and every innkeeper and barmaid better than the lepers and beggar women. For it accorded not with a man of his importance to have acquaintance with the sick lepers. It was not seemly, it profited not to deal with any such poor trash but with all rich folk and sellers of victual. In other words, he's not doing the sort of Christ-like mission of ministering to the least of these, to the, the people who are sick and, uh, and the people who actually need this sort of thing. He's, he's too busy flattering the people that can do things for him. Uh, the people who are a little bit better off, who have a little bit more to, to offer him, rather than him offering guidance and, and that sort of thing to people who actually need it. In fact, he's, it's clear that he's looking down on these people, he's judging these people. And the narrator is complicit with this. The narrator says, you know, it's, of course, well, it's, it's not seemly. There's no profit to, to deal with such poor trash. Um, but rather deal with the rich folk and the people who can, you know, sell him or, or donate uh, the things that he wants. So again, Chaucer the author seems to be portraying this uh, character in a negative fashion, but Chaucer the narrator is saying, oh yeah, that's fine, that's, that's, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And similarly, we have the pardoner, who's uh, somebody who, uh, like the, the friar, is able to supposedly help people purify their soul uh, and uh, give them a pardon from sin, but it, this is an even more economic exchange than just a, a, a friar who, like a priest, would you know, listen to your, your confession uh, and maybe you know, say, here's what you need to do to be right with God. The pardoner has it down to almost like he's selling get out of hell free coupons. Uh, this was a, uh, an institution of the, the medieval church that was starting to come under a lot of scrutiny during Chaucer's lifetime. And that is, people like the pardoner would travel to Rome, would get uh, papal pardons, would get these sort of official documents from the church that is just, uh, you know, here's absolution to whoever uh, buys this pardon. 
Uh, so the, the partner would buy these, and so the, the church is getting this money, then he would go back to England, and he would then sell those for a, a marked up price, uh, just like any other trinket, just like any other commodity. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that, uh, that clearly Chaucer the author is portraying as a very dubious practice, and the person doing it is uh, seems to be very self-interested and, and not at all concerned with actually helping people change their spiritual condition, but he is clearly good at winning people over. And besides these uh, pardons, he also sells uh, fake uh, holy relics, uh, pig's bones that appear to be uh, the bones of saints, because they thought that you know, once a, a saint dies and his body decomposes, if you get like a finger bone or something like that, then there's holy power in that. Well, get somebody to buy this and say it's got this holy power because it was from a saint, but actually it was you know from a dead pig. Uh, this, this person is very much underhanded, but Chaucer, the, the narrator, is not condemning this person, even as Chaucer, the author, brings this forward and, and asks us to, to judge it ourselves. But that doesn't mean that Chaucer is anti-clerical or that he's uh, against the church, much less that he's uh, criticizing Christian religion or Catholicism or anything like that. Uh, we're still, uh, there has been a sort of, of Protestant Reformation, but we haven't, we're still a long way from Martin Luther and the, the actual, the larger scale Protestant Reformation. Uh, it's, he's being critical of individual people, individual actions, individual ways of thinking, but there are still people that work for the church like the, the parson that he describes. Uh, he tells us that the parson would give to his poor parishioners out of the church alms and also of his own substance. In other words, uh, not only is he not demanding a lot from people that, that his parishioners give money to him, but if they're in need, he'll actually take money from the church that he, is his to spend, and he will spend it on them uh, as they need it. Uh, in little, he found sufficiency. In other words, he was okay not having much. The, the monk needed to have these fur-lined robes and all these horses in his stable, and so he can go hunting all the time. Uh, the pardoner, uh, needed to, you know, had this fancy dress, uh, you know, fancy clothes, but the parson got by with very little. He wasn't concerned with these things. This is the kind of person we expect the clergy to be: uh, very modest, very poor, deliberately poor, uh, so that they can give to God and give to the their communities. Unlike the friar, uh, unlike the the monk, we're told that the uh, parson, even in thunder and rain, he would go visit the farthest. Uh, of his parishioners, great or small, in sickness or misfortune, going on foot, his staff in hand, not, not riding on one of his many horses the way the, the monk does. Uh, to his sheep, metaphorically, as the, the pastor, pastor literally means shepherd, uh, but as the shepherd to his uh, congregation, his, his flock, uh, did he give this noble example, which he first set into action and afterward taught. These words he took out of the gospel, and this similitude he added also, that if gold will rust, what shall iron do? In other words, if the, the leaders of the church, the gold, if they are uh, shown, showing this corruption, then you can imagine what's gonna happen to the, the common people, the ordinary people that aren't part of the church. But though he was uh, holy and virtuous, he was not pitiless to sinful men. Uh, nor cold or haughty of speech. In other words, even though he's, he is very righteous, but he doesn't judge other people who are not so righteous. Uh, but he's both discreet and benign in his teaching. To draw folk up to heaven by his fair life and good example, uh, this was his care. In other words, not commanding them, here's, you know, thou shalt do this, but leading by example. Uh, but again, Chaucer the narrator doesn't say anything other than praise. He just seems to, Chaucer the narrator seems to approve the parson, but also approve the, the friar and the monk and the partner, even though these guys all act very differently. That leaves it to us as the reader to decide, well, wait a second, doesn't it seem like the parson is the way the uh, men of the church should behave, whereas the others aren't? Uh, the narrator doesn't give us this, but Chaucer, the author, clearly confronts us with these uh, comparisons. Uh, gives us the comparisons, but doesn't tell us uh, how to think about it or even when he does tell us how to think about it, he's that sort of unreliable narrator that we're not really sure how much we should believe. And then there are characters that we're not told really how to think about. Uh, we have this clerk from Oxford uh, who has a lot in common with the parson in that he's satisfied with little. He doesn't uh, try to exploit his knowledge. Uh, he's not really concerned with gathering things and, and having all sorts of uh, you know, fine clothes and horses and that sort of thing, but he does want books. He wants uh, to connect himself with the learning of the past, and it's uh, biblical uh, and, and church literature, but it's also secular literature, it's also classical literature uh, from Greece and Rome. 
He has 20 volumes of Aristotle in his philosophy. Uh, and just like the, uh, the Great Schism has led people to be suspicious of certain members of the church, uh, people like the, the friar, people like the monk uh, and the pardoner, uh, so too they're uh, starting to look to secular people like the clerk uh, as uh, someone who has moral teaching. Uh, so we're told the clerk, uh, about the clerk, all that he said tended toward moral virtue. Gladly would he learn and gladly teach and except his learnings, his, his virtues that he's teaching and, and learning about uh, comes from Aristotle rather than from the Bible. Uh, this is something that might have seemed heretical at other times, but uh, Chaucer clearly seems to be uh, showing the sort of moral authority in a secular official uh, that, that rivals the authority and, and surpasses some of the authority of some of the other church uh, officials that he notes. And I'm not gonna go through all the, the characters, I just wanted to sort of look and see how Chaucer asks us to uh, examine these characters on our own without giving us necessarily a uh, narration that will tell us what to think about each one. Uh, he gives us a sort of type, but then he undermines that type with certain details. And uh, maybe uh, no character is as popular and as recognized uh, for this sort of, uh, the multitude of, of ways that she could be interpreted uh, as the wife of Bath, probably one of the most uh, famous characters in literature. And so that's, uh, since you read the, the Wife of Bath's tale, uh, we'll talk about her in the next lecture.